Welcome to the Devin Nunes Podcast. Breaking through the political noise, separating fact from fiction. From the San Joaquin Valley, the breadbasket of the solar system. Here is your host, Devin Nunes. Welcome back to the Devin Nunes Podcast. This is the inaugural edition of the Devin Nunes Podcast being on YouTube. And this week for our inaugural edition, uh, we have on Laura Trump, uh, who is obviously related to the president of the United States, Donald Trump, but also married to Eric Trump, and also runs a woman, Women for Trump of the Trump campaign. Lara, thank you so much. This is really cool for you to agree to be on uh, on my first inaugural edition on YouTube. I am so honored. Thank you for having me. Uh, I am uh, connected to President Donald Trump. You are correct. I'm married to his son, Eric, as you just pointed out. And uh, it's been really amazing to be a part of this family and to be part of his campaign now since really 2016. Uh, but I, I could never in a million years have dreamed that I would end up here. But it's, it's awesome and I wouldn't change it for the world. So, you know, you're more than just uh, related to Donald Trump. You were very successful uh, before uh, and you were on Inside <laughs> Edition. And uh, so talk to us about just for the audience, uh, you know, wh where were you born? Where are you from? How did you get into I mean, because you were essentially a, a reporter, right? Yeah, well, I grew up in North Carolina, southeastern North Carolina. I'm from a, a town called Wilmington. Oh, and, right on yeah. the ocean there. Yeah, right, right on the beach. Yeah. Uh, Michael Jordan went to my high school, not at the same time as I was there, but I went to Laney High School there in Wilmington where Michael Jordan went. I went to North Carolina State University and I uh, decided about 12 years ago now to move up to New York. My parents for sure thought I was going to end up like dead in a drainage ditch somewhere because I knew no one in New York at all, uh, but actually moved up to go to culinary school of all crazy things. So I'm technically, Devin, a pastry chef as well. Oh, wow. um, but I had had background in media. Um, I ended up becoming a producer with Inside Edition where I worked for five years. So I was a field producer with them, which meant that I got to go all over the place, travel all across the country, um, interview really interesting people. And um, it's funny how what you do in the past sort of all comes back around and it actually really prepared me, I guess, to do now what I do with the Trump campaign. Um, but yes, you're right. I had, I had a life of my own. I had no idea that everything that I was doing would one day help me uh, be part of the president's campaign, re-election campaign. Um, but I'm, uh, like I said, a pastry chef, a former producer, did some reporting, and uh, now I'm a senior advisor to the Trump campaign. Well, I'm also a uh, aspiring uh, barbecue expert. Oh. Not like, not, this is California barbecue, not like the barbecue <laughs> in the South. So people that follow me on Instagram, uh, they can see all the things that I mess around with on the barbecue, but uh, I'm not even close to pastries or anything. And my wife likes to keep me out of the kitchen. Uh, but, <laughs> but, uh, but people follow me on Instagram. They're always asking me for my recipes, but you know, it's really not any recipes. It's just turn the gas on and, you know, grill it and figure yeah, out, you can you just know, throw the, the right stuff on there. It's, it's much less scientific than baking for sure. But maybe that's, that's the beauty of it. You just kind of let it flow and see what happens. But, uh, all right, I'll have to check that out. And if you need any tips in the kitchen, if we could talk to your wife, and she could let you in there. Uh, I've been trying to teach my son, Luke, who's two and a half years old, since we've been in quarantine, uh, a couple of different recipes. So I'll, I'll let you in on some of those. Well, and speaking of being in quarantine, you're in quarantine, I'm in quarantine. So the <laughs> viewers that are watching, uh, this is from my house. I've got Lee Smith's book behind me about the plot against the president. We've talked about a, a lot about that uh, on, uh, on the podcast over the years. And I've got a little gold tractor behind me. So those of you who are used to seeing me at the world ag, ag expo, that's just a couple miles away, I'm locked out of there. So I can't even do, uh, any news, uh, uh, hits from there when I'm on Fox news or other stations. So I'm stuck in my house, just like, uh, just like you, Laura and the, and all of our audience out there listening. So let me, so, so you're, you're at inside edition. Uh, then you you go to work in 2016 uh, on the campaign. Um, how did that? How did you make that transition in 2016? How did you? Did they force you off the air, or did you just decide you were going to go and and try to help the president get elected? What what was that decision making process like? Well, it was actually kind of interesting because having worked there for so long, I understood 
how the media operated. And I understood that you could take a story that was otherwise relatively benign, change a few words around, kind of insert a soundbite at the specific time you wanted, along with manipulating several other things, and you had a very salacious story. So I remembered thinking well before my father-in-law decided to run for president, you know, some of this stuff is not totally honest. And the way that we portray things aren't always 100% accurate, but that's how, that's how it goes. You know, that's how the mainstream media operates. That's how people sell stories. You get people to click on their websites or click onto, you know, their Twitter page or whatever it is. Um, so I understood that well in advance of my father-in-law running for president. The day he decided to run for president, uh, our whole family was there. You might remember we were all there, Trump Tower together, when he came down the golden escalator with Melania. Uh -huh. We all stood on stage with him after he announced. And I'll never forget going back to work after that. I took the morning off so I could be there for that. And then I remember going back to work and realizing very quickly, wait a minute, the way that we're showing things is not exactly what happened there. I was physically there. I know what my father-in-law said. And we're taking things out of context. So very quickly, it actually became rather challenging, Devin, for me to work at a place that reported every day on my father-in-law. Because let's be honest, from the day in June on, in 2015 when he announced that he was running for president, that's all anybody was talking about. He was on so, television every so day. So you were there. You were there right at that opportune time. You were there with the Russians. Yeah. So like Vladimir was upstairs. You guys were all <laughs> plotting with the Russians. And then you came down. Oh, my escalate. God. I so, can't even tell you how ridiculous all it is. Actually, one of the funny things is before he even came downstairs, before he came down the escalator, we were on his in his office on the 26th floor, and we had all these televisions on, uh, different channels, and they were all saying the same thing. Either this is a publicity stunt, uh, Donald Trump is never running for president, oh, he's announcing a new season of The Apprentice. Like, nobody took him seriously, and we were all looking at each other like, what are we missing? Because we know he's serious. Um, so your, your main question was, how did I get involved with the campaign? I stayed in Inside Edition until August of 2016, and it became challenging. I couldn't work on any political stories. They wouldn't let me report on anything, uh, work on any stories that had to do with the election, with the campaigns, obviously. But uh, my father-in-law actually was traveling down to Wilmington, North Carolina, my hometown, for a rally in August of 2016. I went down with him. And having known the president now, as long as you have now, Devin, you probably can appreciate this. At a certain point, he turned to me and asked me my thoughts on the state. And he was a little frustrated with our state director, I think, at the time. And he kind of sat back and looked at me. And I was like, oh, no, what's, what's about to happen here? And the next thing he said, he goes, you know what? I want to put you in charge of winning North Carolina. Could you do that for me? And of course, I'm like, I don't know anything about politics. I came down here to a rally with you. But of course, I said yes. Um, so I basically went into work the next day and said I need a three-month leave of absence and hit the campaign trail and never looked back. Here I am still. Never looked, never looked back. Yeah. Yeah, and and you know this the Russia thing obviously uh, is something that I've been unfortunately oh. spent the last three and a half years of my life dealing with the fake news. Uh, but just in the last, and a lot of the folks that that follow me on the podcast, they uh, they they like to you know learn about the Russia hoax. And just this week, what we learned, uh, I was being sarcastic about the your meeting okay. with Russians, <laughs> because what we learned now from the Horowitz report and the things that have now been redacted that it actually was never the Trump campaign that colluded with Russians. In fact, it was the Clinton campaign that colluded yep. with Russians. You're exactly funny, right. Funny how that works. And and now you have, now look, I, we're going to get more into this. We're running an investigation. Uh, the Republicans at least are in the House of Representatives. We'll get more information on this. My guess is this was the Clinton campaign and Fusion GPS uh, just trying to dirty up uh, your your father-in-law. Uh, that's it. Started as a dirty trick, like an October surprise. Uh, there probably weren't any actual uh, uh, interactions with the Russians, as much as they just made it up. So there's a lot to still be learned here. That's why we funny, have to run an investigation. Funny, Devin, how you don't hear about uh, that on the news any time. Uh, what? Why isn't that out there? I mean, could you imagine if that were the truth for the Trump campaign? People would go crazy. But of course, well, now they, that we find out. Was the other oh, yeah, side. This would, this would definitely, uh, they would knock coronavirus off of every <laughs> television <laughs> yeah. station, and they'd <laughs> totally. be talking only about how the Trump campaign colluded with oh, the Russians. So, so let, walk me through, just a, let's step back a little bit in time. 
what was it like uh, the first time? Like, I remember my first time uh, meeting uh, uh, President Trump, well, at the time, just Donald Trump. Uh, but what was that like the first time? Like, did you and Eric go on a date and he introduced you to his to his father? How did, how did that all fall out? Tell us an uh, interesting well, story. You know, it's always nerve wracking, I think, to meet anybody that you could possibly call a future in-law, right? When their last name is Trump, it escalates things a little bit. It makes things a little bit more intense. However, I was not uh, given any advance warning by my husband, Eric, then my boyfriend, that I was meeting his dad the day I did. He told me, oh, you want to go to the U.S. Open tennis tournament? I've, I've got tickets. And I thought, that's awesome. I've never been. Of course, we walk in uh, to a suite, which blew my mind because I'd never been in a suite either. And um, there was Donald Trump and there was Melania. And I said, oh, my gosh, you didn't prepare me. Your dad is here. But Devin, you couldn't have been nicer. He sat right down with me, wanted to know about me, wanted to learn about me. And I was still, of course, kind of freaking out because not only is it Donald Trump, but he's my boyfriend's dad. And uh, he did something that I think is so normal and it kind of caught me off guard. He goes, you know what, I'm gonna get an ice cream. What kind of ice cream do you want? I'll get you one too. And I thought, oh my gosh, Donald Trump eats ice cream. And we know that he has two scoops, Devin, right? Always two scoops. Right, right, right. <laughs> but it actually put me at ease. I know it's kind of a funny thing, but I will never forget that moment because I was like, okay, that's totally normal. And it's funny how once you sit down with Donald Trump and you get to know him a little bit, He's really more normal than he has any, you know, he should ever be. Anybody in his position, should, you would ever think. Uh, you can talk to him like a normal person. But that was my first interaction with him. And I was so mad at my husband when we uh, left, my then boyfriend. I said, I can't believe you didn't tell me. But in retrospect, it was actually a good thing. I didn't have time to get nervous. I didn't worry about what I was going to wear, what I'd look like. Um, and he immediately kind of came came at me face to face and wanted to know about me. And it meant a lot to me and I'll, I'll never forget that. And so, you know, one of the things, and I've had some great experiences uh, uh, with the president when he was campaigning, but uh, you know, this the shows about you and uh, an interview with you. So I'll save that for later. Uh, but, but, you know, kind of what you see is what you get. People, a lot of people ask me like, what's he like in person? I said, well, pretty much like what you see him when he's sparring <laughs> yep. with the press, uh, you know, in all the meetings that I've been, I've been with him. So, uh, you know, one of the his keys to success, this is just my opinion, uh, is the guy works nonstop. Like, I, I don't know when he actually sleeps because he just he doesn't stop working. So when you uh, when you were first introduced to the family was, you know, before he was uh, running for president, was that kind of his is that how he operated in business, too? Did he just work all the time? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is I think that's that's how you get to be as successful as Donald Trump, is that you are a workaholic in many respects. Um, no. He was always, even uh, down in Florida, there was always some new deal he was working on, something happening. So even in his time off, he was still working. And I actually see a lot of that in my husband, uh, to tell you the truth. I think he, in terms of business, might be the closest to his dad. Um, but of course, he's, he's always working. He still will call at 11.30 at night and then call again at 6 o'clock in the morning. And I'm like, I, we haven't even slept here. Like, what are you doing? He's up all the time working. Even during the campaign in 2016, he outworked people that were, you know, 20 years old. Everybody was exhausted by the end of a day of several rallies. He kept saying, like, it's too bad we didn't schedule another one. Next time, put another one on my schedule. I have never seen someone with his work ethic and with his stamina in my life. Um, and I don't know that we'll ever see another one quite like him again. But it is the reason that he was so successful as a businessman. And I think it's one of the reasons that he has made sure that the country has been so successful as he's been president. Well, I know uh, I have a very similar story uh, about uh, getting a call. So I, I know when the White House <laughs> is calling, you probably uh, get this too, but like every single device that I have, no matter where I'm at, I start getting calls from at my cell phone, my home, <laughs> my staff starts calling. Uh, and, and, you know, one, one night I was at dinner and I had just put my phone uh, away. Uh, and then oh, one of my no. staff, and it, and it was like, you know, eight o'clock uh, on, a, on a Sunday night, California. So right here, yeah. eight o'clock at night, which is, you know, obviously 11 o'clock at the East Coast. And then my 
my one of my staff are calling me and it shows on the, on my home phone. I said, wow, it's you know must be an emergency. So I answer the phone and say, hey, the president's been trying to get a hold of you for an hour. I said, oh, I've been, I've been eating. And so oh I called him back, and the first thing I said, I was like, what the hell are you doing? It's like 11 o'clock at night. You know, what are you, what are you possibly him. doing? I know. But, uh, but look, it's, it's great for the American people to have somebody who works, works so hard and under such attack. So I have a couple more subjects I want to talk to you about. So what is your, uh, as you know, uh, one of the things that Donald Trump has done is he's, he's ripped uh, the Band-Aid off this problem we've had forever, which is just a biased media. What I like to say is 90% of the media are, are, are not only left wing, but they're activists. And in many cases, they're working for these activists. And you, know, you only have to look as far as you had the Clinton campaign paying a, a racketeering operation like Fusion GPS, that then were a bunch of former reporters that then have all these tentacles out to these reporters and they, they produce dossiers and plant stories uh, with the media. Just the fact that anybody would entertain working with somebody like a Fusion GPS. I know if, if I was a journalist, you know, I've never been trained in journalism or anything like that, but, but I would think, man, this is a little weird to be taking like information from, from people that you know, have a track record of not being very trustworthy if you look at what they've done to Bill Browder and, and Halverson and others. You know, they've been in, involved in a lot of scandals. So the fact that Fusion GPS is out there pushing this on the media and they're willing to take it tells me just how corrupt the media is. And, and I didn't really realize it until, you know, your father, uh, father-in-law won, uh, became the president of the United States. And then within weeks after that, I had been a longtime critic of, of and failures really of, the, of our intelligence agencies and the Obama administration's failure to take on uh, Vladimir Putin and the Russian government. And weeks after the election, you know, I found out that you know I was somehow some Russian agent of some kind. And yeah. I said, "What in the hell is going on here?" So, so I've got my own fake news, funny fake news stories. But uh, what's your favorite fake news story that they've done to to you, or you, or your husband? Oh my gosh! Well, uh, back they just take things out of context. And I was actually explaining it to you uh, a few minutes ago, talking about my time working with Inside Edition, and I know very well how it works. You have one soundbite that in in the context of what you're discussing is perfectly acceptable but when you trim it down Devin to this one soundbite and you give no context it's very easy to make things seem like something they're not so I uh, did an interview back during the government shutdown two years ago and I was asked about it and I gave a perfectly acceptable response well the only thing that the media latched on to is that I said something along the lines of it's it's a little bit of pain right now, but in the long run, you know, I think this is really going to benefit the country. Meaning yeah. that if the the president got through what he wanted to get through, it was ultimately going to be great for the country, right? Well, they took everything I said and made me sound like some, um, you know, disconnected Marie Antoinette type yeah. person. That and I, you know, but th this is how they do it, and you see it right there. You're talking about Russia. In uh, 2016, I will tell you, we couldn't have colluded with Iowa, let alone Russia. So whenever this all came out about the fact that, uh, oh, they're saying the Trump campaign colluded with Russia, we were like, at first we were kind of flattered, like that gives us a lot of credit. Huh. We were such a, a green, I'll say that campaign, none of us had ever done this before. And it, it was so absurd, the whole Russia collusion hoax, but only $2 million a taxpayer, or I'm sorry, two years, and $30 million of taxpayer money to figure out that that wasn't the case. Yeah. And there's more to it, as I think you're going to let us all know very soon. Yeah, and, and it's still going. And, you know, that reminds me of, of, you know, when I when the president first came out to California, when he was campaigning, actually, in August of 2016. Uh, and that's when I first uh, engaged with him. And I remember thinking back, you know, so then three months later, he wins. And then they're accusing me of being some kind of Russian agent. And then, you know, come, then they're doing a whole assessment of how the Russians were trying to help them. And I'm sitting there thinking, I remember the campaign, like, you know, I, I, I there was like, uh, Reince Priebus was there. And I think um, Rudy Giuliani was out here in California. And then there was like Stephen Miller, who's in the White House now, uh, and, and the Twitter guy. And that was it. That was the whole campaign. <laughs> Dan, so, yes, so I know. I don't even know how they'd have any time. There weren't enough people working on the campaign to actually have time so as, crazy. to collude, collude with Russians, much less yeah. somebody in, in Iowa. Yeah. It's totally, totally ridiculous. And 
And look, and, and, and just some, some news this week, I'm sure you, you've seen it, but uh, speaking of Marie Antoinette, so of course, whatever they accuse you of doing is actually what they're doing. So yeah. Nancy Pelosi sitting in her house in San Francisco, uh, we have these, uh, the PPP program that's trying to keep people employed right now uh, is out of money. Mitch McConnell tried to bring that up. It's every, everybody agreed to this you know, a few weeks ago. We have businesses waiting for money so they can pay employees. And meanwhile, we learn uh, that Nancy Pelosi uh, is at her freezer with all this gourmet ice cream. Uh, and of course, you know, nobody's covering it, right? I mean, <gasps> of course, they'll accuse you uh, of something that, that, of that they're actually doing. Yep, that's so, how it goes. So let me, uh, so, you know, I want to thank you for your time, but for folks that want to get involved uh, in the Trump campaign, because you're running uh, the Woman for Trump campaign arm, uh, you know, kind of what do you do on a daily basis and how can people stay informed? Yeah, well, we are a completely digital campaign right now. Obviously, as you said, you're at home. I'm at home as well in New York. Um, social distancing, quarantining, uh, making sure I, we slow the spread of coronavirus. But we still are working 24-7 at the campaign. So we are hosting several events um, a week, virtual town halls, roundtables. You can go to DonaldJTrump.com and you can check all of our events. We list them all there. You can RSVP to join up. Um, you can go to TrumpArmy.com and you can become part of our 880,000 now volunteers across the country. Devin, we know everybody's home, so we want you, we're, we're calling you from the Trump campaign. Um, so we would love everybody to get involved and hopefully we can go back to uh, being together at a Trump rally or coming to you on a bus tour soon. But until then, uh, you can help us out at home on your, your time now quarantining and social distancing. We would love to have you. Well, Lara, thank you so much uh, for, for everything you're doing to help the country. And obviously, I know it's a tremendous uh, burden on your family because I, I know you guys get attacked constantly, uh, both you and your husband and and uh, Everett Melania uh, on down. Uh, I know that that can't be easy for your children, especially to see some of this. Uh, but thank you for thank you for what you're doing. Uh, thank you for being uh, my first guest on, yeah. <laughs> on YouTube guest on my podcast. And uh, and I love uh, Wilmington. I, I I did a huge event there with, uh, and I'm sure you know this, but uh, we went to the big uh, Civic Center there. Uh, in Wilmington, it's a, a newer complex, and we had like 800 people show up because they wanted to learn about the Russia hoax. It was quite amazing. So awesome. So yeah, awesome that was just, there. just well, a few, few months back. I want to say thank you to you, too, because you fight every single day for this country. You're an amazing patriot. I'm honored to be uh, on your, your first guest on the YouTube portion of your show. So thanks for having me, and uh, we'll all keep up the good fight all the way till November 3rd, that's for sure. That sounds great, Laura. Thank you so much. This is you Devin Nunes. We'll catch you next week on the Devin Nunes Podcast and on YouTube. Thanks for listening to the Devin Nunes Podcast. We invite you to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And remember, you can download this podcast on iTunes or at DevinNunes.com. Storm clouds been gathering so long, I don't know. The darkness around us leaves no easy road. We started wondering if every road dreams It whips the dust up and rains pouring down Good people struggling in every hometown We started wondering if we even matter at all We'll take that hard road to happier days Cause we Trial by fire like this It's nothing hard working family can fix We've got the power to save it all here in our hands We'll take that hard road to happier days Cause we kept our American faith We the people
afraid. That's why they call her the home of the brave. With a prayer and a purpose, we're already half the way there. We'll take that hard road to happier days. Cause we've kept our American faith. Paid for by Devin Nunes Campaign Committee.